Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereux in Baltimore, and welcome to part two of our conversation about the anniversary of then-President Ronald Reagan firing 11,000 air traffic controllers. Now joining us to pick up this discussion are our two guests. Joseph McCartan is a professor of history and the director of the Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor at Georgetown University. He's also, also the author of the book Collision Course, Ronald Reagan, the Air Traffic Controllers, and the Strike that Changed America. And joining us by telephone is Elliot Simons. He was the former media spokesperson for Patco Local and was one of the many strikers who lost their jobs after the strike. Thank you both for joining us again. Thank you. So Joseph, we were talking about just the, the impact of, of, of Ronald Reagan's actions um, a little bit in our last in our first part of the interview. So I want to pick it up and, and ask you about the responses of other labor organizations to at the time to this to this firing. Sure. Well, on the morning that the strike took place, which was August 3rd, 1981, it turned out that the AFL-CIO was hosting its annual meeting of its executive council in Chicago. So that meant that all of the presidents of the major unions of the AFL were sitting together at a conference table that morning uh, as Elliot Simons and his colleagues were walking out and forming picket lines outside of the nation's airports. When those union presidents heard that the strike had begun, and moreover, when they heard that Ronald Reagan had issued a 48-hour ultimatum, they were deeply alarmed. Um, and they were also, some of them, miffed and angry because they felt that PATCO couldn't possibly win this strike. And that by walking out, all of the labor movement was sort of out on a limb. And they either had to support PATCO uh, or see it go down but they didn't know how to support the PADCO strike. Some people in the room, um, William Wimp and Singer, the head of the International Association of Machinists, raised the possibility that there ought to be sympathy strikes by other unions. But most union presidents that were present at that time said that that would not go over with their members uh, and that if they tried to call such strikes and they didn't materialize, it would show the whole labor movement to be a paper tiger. So the labor movement basically um, was paralyzed in its response to Reagan. Uh, it came out and made public statements against um, what Reagan's response to this walkout was, but uh, it had trouble forming any consensus to do much more than that. And so sadly, the union movement sort of observed uh, over the next several days as this fateful encounter took place and those workers were fired. It was a huge union busting episode uh, and the labor movement felt powerless at the time to do much about it. Joseph, didn't the AFL-CIO also at the time send out letters to its affiliates, essentially discouraging them to, to stand with um, PATCO workers at the time of the strike? The AFL-CIO itself did not do that, but some of its unions did. Um, uh, some of the union presidents were, in fact, very anti-PATCO, and one of the most important was the president of the Airline Pilots Association. And uh, that president uh, absolutely not only disapproved of PATCO's strike, but felt that that strike would cost airline pilots their jobs. Many of them were being laid off because of the tremendous cutbacks in flights that were allowed by the FAA. And so uh, J.J. O'Donnell was his name, came out with public statements quite critical of PADCO and urging pilots to continue to fly, uh, telling the public that the skies were safe. And that really had a devastating impact on the air traffic controllers. Elliot, I want to bring you back into the conversation because you were a member of PATCO. Do, do you, there's some criticism, though, that, that there was a sort of lack of militancy or, or class politics among unions at the time, which gave Reagan enough confidence to essentially fire so many workers without fearing much retaliation from labor. What's your response to that? My response is slightly different. PATCO at the time, myself included, were so arrogant that we didn't think we needed to help. So there was really not much pre-planning that went on. We felt we were going to shut the air traffic system down. We didn't think they could proceed without us. And 
when it finally happened and all of a sudden it was working, uh, we were really caught short. I, I would just add to what Elliot has said and, and confirm that. And from my research and talking to PATCO leaders as well as leaders of other unions at the time, a lot of those other union leaders were caught by surprise by this strike. They didn't really understand what was happening. And PATCO did believe that they would be able to win it on their own. So they didn't do too much beforehand to build a kind of broad solidarity around their demands. Um, and that proved to be fatal. All right. Joseph, I also want to ask you about the long-term impact of the strike on unions and the labor movement as a whole. Um, just some statistics. I mean, everyone knows that membership in unions has been dwindling for some time. But back in 83, 20% of the American workforce was in a union. Today, it's at about 11%. Did Reagan's action really embolden employers to crush labor, essentially? It absolutely did. And even though this strike um, involved um, fewer than 12,000 federal workers of a very specialized variety, it had an impact well beyond uh, the air traffic control towers of the country, well beyond the federal workforce and deeply into the private sector workforce. When Ronald Reagan replaced the air traffic controllers in 1981, it was still not common for American employers in the private sector to deal with strikes by trying to break them and by permanently replacing workers who'd gone out on strike. But in fact, once Reagan had sort of successfully broken PATCO and retained his popularity um, in the aftermath of that, and that was crucial, employers saw that Reagan was able to do this uh, and in effect get away with it. Many private and se sector employers took a similarly hard line when workers went out on strike in the private sector. Now, federal workers, uh, by law, did not have a right to strike. And by law, Reagan had the right to fire them, as he did. Workers in the private sector, at least by law, were supposed to have the right to strike. But in strike after strike in the 1980s, uh, at places like Phelps Dodge, the copper mine company in Arizona, at Hormel, the meat packers plant up in Austin, Minnesota, and at many other places around the country. When private sector workers went out on strike, their employers simply shut down the negotiations and hired replacements uh, and either broke the unions or forced the unions to come back uh, in a terribly weakened state. So Reagan's action had a huge impact. Yeah, and that huge impact, Elliot, I, I mean, it's being felt today. What sort of advice would you give unions today? What lessons have you learned that you would pass on to them in terms of, in, in terms of lessons that you've learned from your strike? Uh, things are so different today. I'm not sure that I could really give some advice. But certainly the union that replaced PATCO learn the lesson, and they're doing it very well. It's the National Air Traffic Controllers Association, or NATCA. And, in fact, I joke with people, and I say the PATCO strike was the most successful strike in history. NATCA got everything we asked for and more. That's true, and I will say that, you know, the Reagan administration was prepared to meet many of PATCO's demands. Ultimately, they, they did. They just weren't going to do it in that strike. But air traffic controllers who followed Elliott and his colleagues ended up working in under much better conditions than, than Elliott and his colleagues had done. And, and their strike was instrumental in bringing that about. The, the other real key part that, that we didn't understand back then was the force of public opinion back then. And, and again, we thought that we could shut things down and public opinion didn't matter. So we were so wrong. It was a political lesson uh, that we were learning the hard way. And again, if I was going to advise any group of people that were trying to organize, it's to understand the politics, understand what's happening locally and nationally, before they take any action. All right, Elliot Simons, as well as Professor Joseph McCartan, thank you both for joining us. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.